Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Explore at Home, the Great Exhibition Road Festival's online series of events. Um, in Explore at Home, we bring the best of arts, science, nature, technology and innovation and cultural heritage from across South Kensington directly into your homes. My name is Emily Candler. I'm the Executive Director of Discover South Kensington, a partnership of 21 cultural and educational organisations in London's arts and science district. Today, we've got a great discussion lined up for you as we take the story of the two cultures of art and science back 500 years from Renaissance Italy through Victorian London and right up to the present day. It's a discussion that I hope will shine a light on the way we see the separate worlds of art and science in the modern day and how we might bring about greater interdis interdisciplinary collaboration going forward. Before I introduce our speakers, I'd like to remind you that today is an interactive discussion and we'd love to hear your thoughts and comments and questions throughout. Just write in the YouTube chat function and your comments will be passed to me and to the speakers. Um, please be considerate when posting in the chat function. We are moderating and we'll be removing anything that disrupts the experience for others. Now I would like to introduce our speakers. Today I am delighted to be joined by Leslie Primo. Leslie is an art historian, a Renaissance period specialist who's taught at the likes of the Courtauld Institute, the National Gallery, the National Portrait Gallery, as well as here in South Kensington at Imperial College and shortly at the VNA. Hi, Leslie. Thank you. Thank you very much, Emily. Thank you. And uh, I'm very pleased that I've been invited today to this discussion. I'm looking forward to in, uh, uh, enlightening everyone, I suppose, on the Renaissance. <laughs> Great. Um, Angela Kenny is the archivist for the Royal Commission for the Exhibition of 1851, which was set up in 1850 to organise the Great Exhibition and use the profits to develop a centre of scientific, cultural and educational excellence here in South Kensington, which today houses the major museums, universities and colleges. Hello, Hello. Angela. It's lovely to have you here. Hello, Emily. And finally, uh, Roger Kneebone is Professor of Surgical Education and Engagement Science at Imperial College London and Director of the Centre for Performance Science, which is jointly run between Imperial and the Royal College of Music. Outside of his work at Imperial, Roger has been elected as the Professor of Anatomy at the Royal Academy of Arts. Hello, Roger. Hello. Hello. Great pleasure to be here. It's lovely to have the three of you here to talk about arts and sciences through three different periods. And I would like to just kick off by asking you to say a little bit about how arts and science were seen by each other and by the general public at the different periods um, in time that you're all specialists in. Sorry, Roger, I'm calling you a specialist in the, pre in the present day. But we all <laughs> <laughs> um, Leslie, we often think of Renaissance art, but is but the era is much more than that, isn't it? How would you define the Renaissance man? Well, that's a good question, Emily. Yes, the Renaissance man, how would I define him? Well, in fact, the Renaissance man was seen to be somebody who was a specialist in a variety of fields. And in fact, the field of painting was just one of the fields that he was supposed to be a specialist in. A Renaissance man would understand uh, the properties of how to work with gold, for instance. We know that many Renaissance artists were actually goldsmiths before they actually went into the idea of arts. A typical Renaissance workshop would work in gold, would work in a uh, prints as well because we know that they did uh, engravings on copper plate engraving prints. We know that tapestry was also made in Renaissance workshops as well. Uh, there would be pen and ink drawing, black chalk drawing, uh, a whole variety of mediums. Uh, terracotta as well uh, was used and of course uh, marble. So you had to have a command of all of these different skills. Uh, Renaissance men also would be expected to have some knowledge of the classical world as well. And uh, even better if you had some Latin, which we know some Renaissance men did. Uh, and some taught themselves Latin, such as Leonardo, who taught himself Latin and didn't learn Latin at school. Uh, so we uh, have a whole gamut. In other words, in many ways, a Renaissance man is what we mostly call a polymath nowadays. Uh, somebody who could uh, uh, have this extraordinary knowledge across all of these disciplines. I think that's really interesting thinking about the individual holding that expertise and I'd like to come back to that uh, to later on in the discussion. Um, Angela, in, in the uh, Victorian period when they were setting up the Great Exhibition, were they thinking of arts and sciences as two separate uh, disciplines? What was, the, uh, what was the impetus behind setting up the Great Exhibition? Well, I think that the impetus um, behind setting it up was really to showcase British design, but there was a feeling that perhaps art um, wasn't impacting British design. In the 30s, there'd been a, a select committee that had um, concluded that 
uh, British design and the study of art weren't actually impacting manufacturing. And this was leading to a, a decline in demand for British goods. And certainly in the... Um, in the 40s, then uh, Richard Redgrave, who was a landscape artist, was concerned that there was no feed over from arts into the manufacturing. And so one of the um, reasons for the Great Exhibition was to try and encourage a, a, an interest in design and certainly in what came after the Great Exhibition as well. That was the Victorians and particularly Al Prince Albert's um, impetus was to encourage that um, uh, encourage art and design so that they could have an impact on, on science and manufacturing. Thank you. And, and Roger, combining arts and sciences has been a big part of your career. Can you just uh, give us a little introduction to that and some of the projects that you've worked on and mm. how you see the crossover between arts and science today? Well, I, I think one of the problems at the moment is that, that there has arisen a, a, a separation in many people's minds between art and science, which I think in a lot of ways is artificial, actually, but it's very unhelpful. And it, it kind of polarises things into thinking, a lot of people thinking that science is where uh, useful, worthwhile, economically productive work happens and art is where people go for relaxation or to do other things entirely and actually uh, it seems to me that there is quite as much art in a lot of science and quite a lot of science uh, quite a lot of science in, in in a lot of art but we just we, we just don't notice it and so uh, a lot of the work that I do explores what happens if we look through uh, at one world through the lens of another if we look at the worlds of, of, of medicine or science or engineering say through the uh, the lens of a visual or performance artist or the other way and we see different things um so uh emily for example you mentioned the center for performance science which i i lead with the royal college of, of music has been a very interesting way of looking at aspects of clinical performance uh clinical practice rather that you might think of as performance working with close-up magicians for instance to look at how performers and audiences respond to one another uh, another project that I've, I've been uh, leading is looking at um, the what goes on in the operating theatre, how people work together through the eyes of a puppeteer who also works with people who have to have to collaborate with others while focusing on a on a puppet to make that puppet look as if it was alive. And although these may appear to be very different, when you look more closely, you find there are fascinating areas of overlap. Absolutely. That that sense of science and art being po polarised. Um, Leslie, was that a concept in the nine, in the Renaissance period? Did they think of set arts and science as separate disciplines or in, in, a, in a conscious way? Well, no, they did not think of them as separate disciplines. In fact, in the Renaissance period, um, it was all the same thing. So in other words, if you were a so-called artist or craftsman, you, you would be called upon uh, to design things as well as uh, make things. So, of course, a, a great example is uh, Filippo Brunelleschi, uh, who was an architect, but seen also as an artist. Uh, and uh, his grasp of uh, architectural structures and design uh, were certainly uh, ones that were called upon uh, and in fact no one saw Brunelleschi as being either an artist or a, a or, or an architect in fact the two were certainly not separated uh, and of course you know that of course Brunelleschi's dome was part of this uh, uh, new um, approach that Brunelleschi had found out in fact what Brunelleschi did was to look at ancient buildings uh, such as the Pantheon in Rome to get his eyes idea of how to actually achieve the dome itself. The dome, of course, made between 1446 and 14, uh, and 1461, uh, the dome, uh, and it was quite an achievement for its time. But uh, like many uh, artists, Brunelleschi also was uh, uh, in competition with other artists as well to produce decorative effects, such as the doors of the baptistry, which he was in the competition uh, against uh, Lorenzo Gilberti for that, and actually lost that competition to Gilberti uh, to produce the doors of the baptistry. And that also uh, was seen as something that Brunelleschi should be doing. Uh, and of course, he produced his um, uh, 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 image for it. In fact, uh, his uh, submission for it is still in the Bargello Museum in Florence, uh, which is a, a, a copper, uh, as it were, brass plate, copper plate for the door. Uh, so yes, there was no real separation. In fact, I don't, you know, nobody really sort of said, oh, science, this is science and this is art. Um, 
In fact, uh, as far as most patrons were concerned, these were craftsmen doing a job of work, and they should be able to turn their hand to any job of work uh, that craftsmen should be able to do, such as painting boats, for instance, uh, building city defences, all sorts of things like that were seen as the job of that person. Uh, and no one uh, thought that perhaps we should go to a scientist or a maybe a, an artist to have separate works done. They could all be done by the same person. That's, some, that's very interesting to hear about that um, that sense of craftsmanship. Um, um, Angela, I wanted to ask you, Roger said to us before that the um, we, today we've seen arts and sciences sort of separated with science seen as the um, more economic driving force and arts as a, as a, as the more the leisure activity. But in the in, in the mid 19th century, what was the impetus bringing together arts and sciences that, that led to the creation of this arts and science district that we're in today? Well, the major impetus was the, the Great Exhibition, where um, British goods didn't win anywhere near as many medals as French goods did. Um, French goods were seen as being of much better design than British goods. Um, and so it was really that that led the Royal Commission um, and Prince Albert to think that they needed to, to foster um, a better relationship between arts and sciences, between uh, manufacturing and arts. Um, and so with the profits from the Great Exhibition, that was what they, they set about doing. Can you give us a flavour of some of the things that might have been seen in the Great Exhibition? Yes. So people would have seen some amazing things um, all gathered under one roof. One of the major things that they would have seen, of course, was the Crystal Palace itself, which you can see in this picture. And this would have been absolutely astonishing to people travelling to London uh, for the Great Exhibition. It was 1,848 feet long, so it would have seemed absolutely vast to people coming to, to the capital, um, all made out of um, glass as well, so it would have looked very spectacular. And then if we go inside on the next um, picture, we can see the, the central transept of the Crystal Palace, um, and you'll see that there are some trees inside because um, as part of Paxton's design for the Crystal Palace, was to give this arched roof so that the trees that were in uh, Hyde Park already could be kept inside the building. And then um, at the front of that, we've got the Colebrookdale gates, which were huge iron gates, which can still be seen in Hyde Park near the Albert Memorial, and Osler's Crystal Fountain, which again was all made out of glass and would have looked incredibly spectacular. But then the, the building itself was filled with uh, machinery, which was actually working. There was a, a generator to provide steam for um, the machines that were working. There were goods from all over the world, um, a lot of Indian goods. And that included um, a couple of howders, which are the seats that go on the back of elephants. Um, and the commission managed to find an elephant in Saffron Walden Museum, a stuffed elephant, so that they could put one of the howders actually onto an elephant. It was an African elephant, unfortunately, but it was the only one available, so that had to be used. Um, it's, it's, from all over the, the known world were, were on display. It's hard for us to imagine the impact of it because we're so, well, many of us have been lucky enough to travel. We've seen video and, and, uh, and photos, colour photos from around the world if we haven't travelled. And to that sense of onslaught of the senses uh, is, is, um, is, is quite phenomenal. But did the organisers view it as a success? They, they viewed it as a huge uh, success. And when, it, when they were planning the exhibition, then it was thought that it would make a loss and they were making contingency plans um, to, to cope with that. But in actual fact, it made £186,000, which is a lot of money in those days. Um, there were six million people travelled to London to visit the Great Exhibition. Um, some of those coming from abroad, a lot of them travelling from all corners of the UK, um, mainly on train excursions from the big manufacturing cities of the north, organised by Thomas Cook. Um, so lots of people attended. There were uh, um, 100,000 exhibits at the Great Exhibition, 13,000 exhibitors. So it was just, it was a huge success. Yeah. And, 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 and uh, 
was it quite easy to work out what to do with the profits afterwards that they've made the well when, when it got to, uh, when it got to about august the the exhibition ran from the 1st of may 1851 until the 18th of october when it got to about august it was becoming obvious that a lot of money was going to be made and so um Prince Albert wrote a memorandum saying what he thought should happen to the money. And he uh, suggested that it be spent on purchasing a, an estate in South Kensington and that on that estate they build four institutions that were linked to the different bits of the Great Exhibition. So uh, a raw materials, machinery, um, uh, arts, four, four institutions all of whom would provide education. And his intention was that there would be discussions and there would be libraries, that people would learn from what he called ocular observation, I suppose actually looking at things, seeing, seeing good design, and that this estate would become, a yes, an arts and science quarter for London um, to encourage people to, to learn about design and to have an impact on manufacturing. And so this, the, the uh, picture you can see on the screen is the estate that the commission did actually go on and, and purchase. And I can see that's Exhibition Road, the road down on the right. A very, very good idea to set up an arts and science district. I have to say it's uh, it's thriving. Um, it's just reopened and it's thriving today. Yes. Um, and became known as, known as Albertopolis, of course. Known as Albertopolis, yeah. Um, Leslie, I'm really struck here by this conversation where Angela's talking about setting up of institutions in proximity mm. and mm. you were talking about individuals and was, was was there a sense of proximity being important there and was uh, you know why was it all happening in Italy at that point is it is it about the congregation of of, mm. of people that is that leads to this um this sparking of creativity and interdisciplinarity yeah in part Emily it is about um, a proximity and a congregation of people because of course uh, much of the uh, renaissance that we know today uh, um, centered on Florence so you've got quite a lot of artists in Florence all at the same time Raphael is in Florence Michelangelo is in Florence Leonardo is in Florence uh, Botticelli is in Florence they're all in Florence and of course none of those artists um, actually um, came from Florence uh, 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 Michelangelo was born in Caprese which is just outside of Florence Leonardo clearly born in Vinci, also outside of Florence. Raphael was from Urbino, uh, clearly not Florence either, and so on. In fact, it's only Botticelli who was actually from Florence. So uh, there's a coming together in Florence of all of these artists. So yes, uh, there is this idea of coming together. But the idea that there is no Renaissance anywhere else is not true. In fact, uh, we know that Renaissance painting got started in the city of Lucca uh, much earlier than it did uh, in Florence. Uh, we also know, of course, there's a Renaissance going on in Germany at the pretty much the same time, our, uh, artists such as Albrecht Dürer, uh, born in 1471, uh, which in fact is just four years before Michelangelo was born, of course, in 1475. Albrecht Dürer even travelled to Italy and arrived in uh, Venice in 1494. Uh, so uh, there's Renaissance everywhere. Uh, of course, we could also say um, uh, uh, Holbein is also Renaissance, born in 1497-8 stroke eight in Augsburg in Germany. Uh, so uh, we can see uh, a flourishing uh, throughout those areas. But what we also have is proximity of workshops as well. So the Verrocchio workshop, for instance, uh, uh, is a, a good example of how these workshops um, um, operated in Florence. Uh, I think that's um, slide three on our list. Uh, we can see that with Verrocchio, uh, he, uh, 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 his workshop is in close proximity uh, with the workshop of, say, the uh, Polaiulo brothers, who are another Florentine workshop. And in these examples here, you can see the range of work that happened in the Verrocchio workshop. The painting that you can see of Tobias and the Angel, uh, now at the National Gallery, is known to have, uh, known now to, in fact, have the hand of at least five different artists in this one painting. Although the signature of the picture is uh, Andrea del Verrocchio, uh, we know that Leonardo was involved in this and many other assistants who were in the Verrocchio workshop at the time. The dog, for instance, at the lower left of the picture, we now believe to be by a young Leonardo in the workshop. And to give you a range of what was happening in the workshop, you'll see with these other images, everything that you see here from the same workshop, the candlestick holder that you can see at the far right of your image made in the Verrocchio workshop. So they're making candlestick holders for churches as well. Uh, the uh, 
piece of sculpture at the bottom actually is terracotta. So they've obviously got an oven where they're firing terracotta in the workshop at the same time. And the drawing that you can see there uh, has these little dots in it. You can just about <coughs> see that it comprises of lots of minute dots. Uh, this is a template uh, drawing that was used to produce images like you see on the left. In other words, uh, you just put this on your canvas or panel and uh, use it to actually push black chalk through the holes uh, and then it leaves an outline and then you join the dots. And once you do that, you have a consistency throughout the workshop of pictures that look the same by the same person again and again, because in effect, they are by the same person uh, because the person who made the template is the person who's responsible for the art that eventually comes from it. Uh, you might also notice that there's a little signature on that drawing that says um, Da Vinci at the bottom right of the drawing. Uh, it is not a drawing by Leonardo Da Vinci. Uh, that is in fact a fake signature by somebody trying to pass off the drawing as a drawing by Leonardo da Vinci. Uh, so all the sort of stuff uh, goes on in workshops. Uh, the fake signature, by the way, is much later. It's more like an 18th century signature. <laughs> <laughs> Roger, how, to what extent has um, proximity driven um, your practice, the, the collaboration between Imperial College and the Royal College of Music, which back on to each other, that the uh, not a historical accident. Angela's told us it's by design that the arts and sciences are right next door to each other. But how how has that proximity helped spark the conversation? It, it, it's helped me enormously in the way I've been thinking about it. But I think that al although these, uh, as we've been as we've been hearing, these organisations are very close to one another physically i think that in a sense there has been a sort of separation from them in in often in the way that they think and the way that they they work together and i think we've got this fantastic opportunity at the moment to to bring these perspectives together um partly there are the things that those organizations do that we as visitors are aware of you know when we go and see the the you know objects from the great exhibition or or, or much earlier but there's also the stuff that goes on behind the scenes. And I think that's very interesting as well, because if you I've had the opportunity to go behind the scenes in, in many of the conservation workshops, for example, at the uh, at the V&A. And, and they're the things that go on are very much like the things that you might see in a science lab or. Uh, well, and, and, and of course, they are science labs in, in many ways. And it made me think when I was listening to what Leslie was saying just now about the uh, the sort of m many, many hands on the on the pen, you know, the the many people who would be part of of creating a, a picture like Tobias and the and the Angel, for example, made me think of what goes on in a in a present day uh, experimental science lab, say, where the um, the work that goes on there is normally judged by the by the the discoveries and the reports and the things that are written in journal articles, which are published often under the the overall um, name of a, of a leader. But actually, if you look at what goes on, it's very much a collaborative. It's collaborative work. You've got people with many different kinds of skills doing things in laboratories with their hands, with apparatus, with equipment, with reagents, with one another. Um, and they have different perspectives and, and different strengths. Uh, and all these come together in an effective um, laboratory in a way that to me sounded very similar um, to what Leslie was describing in a, in a Renaissance workshop. And I think the same thing happens in a, in a clinical environment. So my own experience as a, as a surgeon in the first part of my career, particularly a trauma surgeon, working very closely with 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 many members of the, the team, you know, other surgeons, anaesthetists, nurses, um, all sorts of other members of the team to to do something that wasn't the uh, wasn't the the work of one person alone ever. It was always collaborative, but it required the integration of people with very different kinds of skills. Uh, and to come together to create something that was recognizable as a successful experiment, a successful operation, whatever it might happen to be. But it was always a group effort and it always involved not only knowing stuff, but being able to do stuff and bringing together people who were highly, highly skilled in an environment that allowed them to exchange their perspectives and learn from one another. Is it that sense of being highly skilled, that sense of expertise, which really enables collaboration that you have, you bring together people who are different experts in their field. What's that? What's yeah. is it? Yeah. I think so. I mean, I've been thinking a lot about what it means to become expert over the last few years. And I think that um, it's, it's quite a complex process, but I think the beginning of it involves just spending a great deal of time learning how to do something. 
uh, and you you do that by by being there on the spot, actually doing stuff again and again and again. You're you're learning facts, of course. You're learning skills, and you're putting it all together until you get to the point where you can then apply it. You can go out on your own. You can sort of apply your craft, as it might have been in the medieval sort of shift from being an apprentice to becoming a journeyman, uh, and then finally becoming a a master. And then you get to the stage where you can start to share those things. You can draw on the essence of what you've learnt and abstract it from the specifics and then share that with other people. So if I can give you one brief example, I, I, I run a master's in education, in surgical education, uh, and uh, a while ago took the students from our master's course to, uh, to the um, Central St. Martin's ceramics workshop, where we spent some time with an uh, expert ceramicist called Duncan Hewson and his students. And although at first we thought that there would be very little in common between our two worlds, it turned out uh, that he was able to identify what he called working with thin materials on the verge of collapse, which is when you're, in his case, sort of thinning out the neck of a, of a vase on a, on a wheel, you get to the point where it's, it's almost thin enough to be, uh, to be just right, but any further and it'll collapse. And the surgeons too understood that, although they never worked with clay, because when you're working with elderly people or sick people, you're having to make these judgments about how hard you can pull something or how, how, how tightly you tie a suture or whatever. And so there was a, at the level of, of an essence of what we all did, we understood one another, even though we had come to those understandings from very different places. And I think that to me goes to the heart of what you can share with other people who've been along a similar journey, even though it's from a very different place. Leslie, how does this relate to what uh, what, you, what you know from the Renaissance period about hearing what, what Roger's talking about, how things work today? Well, uh, that's interesting that Roger mentioned theatre on a number of occasions uh, in uh, his talk today. Uh, and uh, yeah, theatre is what um, we find with um, situations such as Leonardo, uh, uh, as it were, doing dissections, because of course there's a reason why theatre is called theatre, isn't it really, operating theatres, because in fact uh, they become places of entertainment almost, uh, where you see uh, dissections taking place. And we know that uh, Leonardo, uh, of course, took advantage of this by actually going along to um, uh, theatres where operations or, or dissections were taking place. Uh, what he did was to actually learn from those physicians uh, at those, in those theatres how to do it himself. And of course, once he'd learned from those um, physicians who were actually operating or doing dissections, usually at this, uh, the, the church hospital of Santa Maria Nuova uh, in Florence, he then took those ideas and put them into his own practice as well. So it's a, a, an immediate crossover between uh, these uh, uh, the anatomists who were making dissections that Leonardo learned directly from. And you'll see here in the drawings that we've got, that Leonardo uh, starts to put it in entirely into practice uh, with these actual with these drawings. In fact, um, uh, Leonardo would say in his own words, and I quote, uh, this old man, a few hours before his death, told me he had lived a hundred years and that he was aware of nothing wrong with his body other than weakness. And thus, sitting on a bed in the hospital of Santa Maria Nuova, he passed from this life and I made a dissection to see the cause of so sweet a death. This I found to be from the lack of blood for the artery that nourishes the heart and other parts below it, which I found very dry, thin and withered. Uh, so this, in effect, is an autopsy. And you'll see from the drawings here that Leonardo makes careful notes of everything he's doing. So it's not merely a dissection, it is an autopsy. So the theatre of dissection is very much very part of this. But you'll see that in the drawing on the right, though, uh, that this is clearly Leonardo um, combining um, artistic imagination with knowledge of, uh, uh, of, the, of anatomy, because clearly he did not dissect a pregnant woman. Uh, even uh, that would be certainly beyond the pale. So what he's done here instead is, in fact, to dissect a cow uh, and then imagine how a fetus would look like in the womb. So uh, this is artistic interpretation as well as science coming together uh, to produce the image of that child in a womb. 
Certainly. And Roger, coming right up to the modern day, you are Professor of Anatomy at the Royal College of Art. Um, mm. What does that role encompass? It's a, a strong well, history, but... Um, it's a very interesting role. It's, it's an honorary position, but the, the Royal Academy of Arts, which many people will know is uh, uh, Burlington House on Piccadilly now, uh, was established in 1760, at the end of 1768, I think, with Joshua Reynolds as its first, um, as its first president. And, and a month or so later, it appointed its first professor of anatomy, who was William Hunter, one of two famous Hunter brothers. Uh, the one, his brother John, is particularly well known in London. There's a Hunterian Museum at the Royal College of Surgeons. But William Hunter um, was a very interesting man in that he was an uh, he was a practicing clinician too. He was an obstetrician, and he worked with. Um, he worked with a number of artists, one called Jan van Riemsdyk, for example, to create a very beautiful image called the, um, uh, anyway, it, 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 it's a, a, a rather like the Leonardo image, but several centuries later, it's looking at a fetus in utero. Mm -hmm. And so it's looking uh, from an artist's point of view at what that looks like. And then there's William Hunter, who's who's engaging with the, with the world of obstetrics as a clinician delivering babies. Um, and then there is that tradition of, people learning uh, learning the visual arts, very much focusing on, on anatomy and the human body, life drawing, all those things that went on for, 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 for a long, long time. And there has always been a professor of anatomy. Uh, it's an unbroken line and I'm the, the 14th. Now, of course, the role of anatomy in the work of the Royal Academy has changed now because there's much less emphasis on life drawing and things. But nonetheless, that idea, I think, of bringing uh, an expert view from outside the world of uh, of the arts and bringing it in. There's also there's also a, a professor of chemistry, for example, um, traditionally uh, involved in the composition of paints and, and materials and that kind of thing. But I think there's something interesting in this historical recognition that multiple perspectives are very valuable. And so it's a role I'm very keen to to develop and explore in new directions. Oh. We're getting lots of questions coming in, and I just wanted to ask um, Leslie. Uh, we've got a question from Susan about the uh, how, how important royal and artist, artist, aristocratic patronage was uh, for the development of art and science in Renaissance. And we, we will hear, uh, and, and then I'll come on to Angela to hear about the personal role of the royal family in, 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 in the nineteenth century. Yeah, indeed. Yeah. Art and uh, patronage was incredibly uh, important in the Renaissance period. And of course, some of the major patrons really are responsible for some of the great works that we have to this day. Of course, the Medici family is is one of those patrons that were, in fact, major contributors to the arts. But we also have uh, contributors such as Isabella, Isabella d'Este, the Marchioness of Mantua, who was a, a, a major patron of the arts as well, uh, patronizing artists such as uh, Leonardo and Michelangelo. Uh, so patrons incredibly uh, in, uh, uh, important in this period. And in fact, most artists really basically couldn't get anything done without pet, uh, patronal approval. In other words, uh, uh, the, the materials that they needed to make the work in the first place could not be afforded by the individual artists unless they had a patron who was actually willing to put the money up for, to pay for those materials. And we know about um, this because, in fact, uh, in 1972, uh, we found Michelangelo's bank accounts in an archive in Florence. Uh, and it, we, we can see exactly how much he's been paid by which patrons and for what he's been paid for, even to purchase a, a grey dappled horse as well, uh, to go to the, uh, the, the quarries of Carrara to bring back some marble uh, and the harness and so on. All these um, incidentals we find out about. But I think when it comes to uh, patrons uh, in uh, the present uh, day, uh, it's a very different situation. Uh, we've been through um, what we now call an art market, which of course is first established in the Netherlands in the 17th century. So um, with the emergence of an art market, we see the shift from the patrons being uh, huge wealthy people to in fact becoming, uh, well, corporations, as it were, who we now rely on for sponsorship of um, exhibitions. Roger. Yeah, I just I just wanted to uh, maybe ask Angela about that, because it seems to me that, that Albert was playing a very important role as, as, a, as a person, not just somebody occupying that role, uh, you know, that position um, as, as, a, as Prince Consort. But, you know, is, is that idea of, of patronage, is it still there in, in what we saw in the 19th century? Yeah, I mean, it, Albert was absolutely crucial, really, to the Great Exhibition and to what came afterwards. There'd been a number of exhibitions in the 1840s, which were sort of small scale affairs by the Royal uh, Society of Arts. But Albert becoming involved 
um, meant that it became a huge international exhibition. Um, and he managed to galvanise people around him to organise it. Um, it was him who set up the Royal Commission to organise it. And it was that um, personal role that he took, really, that really developed it and later developed Albertopolis. He, he was involved in the sort of the minutest decisions about what colours things should be painted and what trees should be planted around Albertopolis. Um, he really took a, a very, very detailed interest in what was going on. Um, and pulled together very able people around him, like Henry Cole, to help organise it all. Um, and even though he died in 1861, when Albertopolis had really only just uh, was starting to come into being, it was his plan that Henry Cole and others picked up and continued to, to run with. And then where, where should the patronage to, today, what's driving the interdisciplinary collaboration um, today come from? Any any thoughts on that, uh, Roger? Well, I mean, I don't think we have a better in, in quite that way. Although, of course, there are um, inspiring organisations, aren't there? Uh, they're, they're, you know, like the, the Welcome uh, Trust, for example, or Lever Hume or Templeton. You know, there, there are a number of Mellon. Uh, there are a number of sort of philanthropic organisations who have a, a, a very clear vision of, of the importance of, of continuing that tradition and developing it, I think. Um, it's... Uh, it's, maybe it's a different climate though now, isn't it? Because as I said at the beginning, there is this, I think there is this very unhelpful sense of the uh, of, of, of a sort of hierarchical distinction between things that are useful and things that are not, uh, and things that are essential and things that are optional um, and all that kind of thing. And I, I think this really goes to the heart of a fundamental misconception of, of what we're talking about when we, when we try and make these distinctions between art and science. And it, I think it's a false dichotomy and we really need to do what we can to, to extinguish it because it is so unhelpful. Uh, Angela, um, in, in terms of patrons bringing together arts and science, the Royal Commission is doing exactly that still well, today. I think, yes, I think we like to think of ourselves as being uh, very much in that mould of pulling together arts and science. At the end of the exhibition, then the Commission was, it was intended originally that the Commission would cease to exist. And because it made this profit, then we were given a second charter, supplemental charter. And um, the commission that we were given was to extend the influence of science and art upon productive industry. And that is still the main thrust of the work that the commission does to this day. So we try to pull together the institutions in Albertopolis. We um, give grants to uh, students and postdoc researchers, many of whom are working at the Royal College of Arts and Imperial College you know, on joint courses. Uh, lots of people doing industrial design um, and people really at the, the cutting edge of science and, and uh, art. I, uh, I'm very grateful for funding from the Royal Commission for a project we're working on this summer, which is bringing together arts and science, um, biodiversity, architecture, engineering. And it was just making me think when you were talking, uh, Leslie, because we are having exactly the discussions about who's paying for the materials and who's paying for the transport. No one yet has asked me for a grey dapple pony, but um, mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> we'll wait and see if that level of detail comes. Um, <laughs> Um, Roger, I, I, I'd love to come back to you and what you've learned about the sort of the physicality of the crafts. Roger, Leslie mentioned the craft work of a Renaissance studio, and I, I know it's something you've really picked up on and, and, and built new relationships with. Can you mm. tell us a little bit? Yeah, about I think it's it's very interesting. I mean, from my own ex 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 sort of experience in the world of operative surgery, which I, I initially thought of as a medical student as, as the, the sort of acquiring and then applying scientific knowledge as a sort of applied science. But the more I, I did of actually becoming a, a, a surgeon and, and then later in my career as well, the more I realized that this is very much a craft as well. And that involves doing things that are very physical, doing things with your hands. Um, and I've had the opportunity to, to develop a couple of collaborations that have really brought that into focus. I thought if I just show you an image, which is image number 10, I think the last one in the list. Um, this is, um, this is a, a piece of work that was created by um, Fleur Oaks, who's a, a, a three-dimensional embroiderer, a textile artist, whom, uh, <clears throat> who, who for the last couple of years has been the embroiderer, the lace maker in residence in the vascular surgery unit at St. Mary's Hospital, part of Imperial. And Fleur, who is a textile artist who'd never been into the uh, operating theatre at all <clears throat> until she started this project, spent a couple of years watching surgical teams 
and and what she saw uh, was not what I saw in the operating theater. She didn't see details of anatomy and disease and things like that. What she saw was textures and colors and consistencies and how people work together uh, to do delicate things um, that have to be done with great precision. And so this is her textile body, which is a representation of what she saw through the medium of textile. So you can see there that there's some yellow knitted stuff which represents the fat uh, and then Underneath there are there are structures which don't have a precise anatomical name, but they 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 show how people uh, need to work together to move their way round things to get down to something small deep inside. And this is a uh, a group of uh, of teenagers actually at the Welcome Collection a couple of years ago, where we invited them to come and experience the nature of surgical work without having to have any surgical knowledge. And so they're working together even though they've never met in collaboration to help one another move things out of the way and do things that surgeons do. And I thought that was very interesting because this goes to the craftsmanship of, of, of surgery separate, separate from the sort of biomedical knowledge, if you like. And then if we go back two slides, I think, to, um, to the one before that, I think this is a, a, another interesting image because it gives a different perspective, again, on the world of surgery. So this is a uh, this is a painting by Barbara Hepworth, actually. Many people, uh, and I was one of them, thought of her as a primarily a sculptor, and, and she is, of course, primarily that, but she, in the 1940s, created, a, I think, a very beautiful set of images uh, when she spent a lot of time watching surgery when one of her triplets was having surgery for uh, a bone infection. And so here we are, this is uh, Concourse II, one of those images, which I think really looks back to the, uh, to the 14th century in many ways, um, but it's clearly an operative team. But the interesting thing is that you can't see much in the way of detail. You can't see the patient, you can't see the anesthetic machine, you don't see any instruments to speak of, but what you do see is something that I was aware of, but, but hadn't noticed in this way till I saw this picture, I think, which is the people and their point of focus and the fact that you're you're really looking at their at their eyes and their sense of concentration and right in the middle of the picture almost exaggerated are the are the the, the lead surgeon's hands and so i think to me this picture is about what barbara hepworth noticed at a time just at the very beginning of the introduction of the nhs um when she was seeing the the sort of essence of a surgical team in looking after a vulnerable patient that they all had a collective responsibility for. And to me, this, this really captures a sort of emotional side that's easy to overlook if you're focusing uh, on the technical. So if we just go back one slide, um, I think this, this well-known image of a duck and a rabbit, you know, which you can see in either way, uh, depending on whether you choose to see it as a duck looking to the left or a rabbit looking to the right, you can see the clinical environment as uh, the application of scientific knowledge, or you can see it as as the provision of care, or you can see it as performance. Um, and I think that that goes for pretty much all these environments we've been talking about, uh, from the Renaissance to the, to the Victorian time and to where we are now, you can see them in different ways according to how you look. But often we think only to look in the way that we've been trained to look. We see everything as a duck or everything as a rabbit, rather than thinking that we can shift our point of view. We've got some interesting questions and points in the chat from um, Fish Kettle, who's a, is a so we're not real name Fish Kettle, but a, a, maybe um, a chemist and, and saying how uh, they find it uh, extraordinary. Some of their colleagues have little or no interest in the arts or aesthetics. And then uh, also from, from uh, Cara Jackson about um, how artists have to be very much interested in the material properties. Um, uh, and, and uh, Roger, you've been working with chemistry students and, and looking at how they manipulate I, I have, materials. Yes, you? yes I, I have. I've been leading a, a project called The Chemical Kitchen, actually, where we, uh, working with a chef and, uh, and the professor of synthetic chemistry at Imperial, we've developed a, a sort of kitchen, a culinary equivalent to the chemistry laboratory so that undergraduate students who just join Imperial who often have, well, who always have very high A-level results, but, but aren't always particularly experienced in doing things with their hands, where we invite them to use uh, practices in the kitchen to practice doing things that require precision and delicacy, accurate documentation, weighing, measuring, keeping things to temperature, all these things that, that, that are actually just as important in a chemistry lab, but you don't want to look like an idiot in front of your chemistry professor if you get it wrong, but actually nobody expects you to make a fantastic souffle if you're studying chemistry. And so this idea of, of abstracting 
these practices of a, of a scientific environment and looking at them in another way. Um, and I think that that's, that's very interesting because it kind of moves things away from your primary area of practice with all the pressures that that has and allows you to think differently. So if I can just briefly show one other, the final picture, which is a, an example of people coming together. I organized a symposium a couple of years ago called The Art of Performing Science, uh, where we got 70 people from science, medicine, the performing arts, the visual, visual arts. And here on the right is a plastic surgeon. In the middle is a, a letter cutter in stone and wood. And on the left is an orthopedic surgeon, consultant hand surgeon. And the two people who are making a, the, the hand surgeon and the letter cutter are talking to the, to the man on the right using a gestural language where they are trying to explain what they both do with, with hard materials and sharp tools, whether it's making uh, incisions in a, in a piece of stone or wood, or whether it's making incisions in a piece of bone. Um, and it turned out that they, that they have different words, but they share a, a, an embodied gestural understanding of what that work involves, how, how hard you can hit it without shattering it, how you know when you're getting to the edge, all those things. And I think there's something about creating the conditions where people can come together and have conversations of that kind, which to me resonates with what was going on in the, in the 19th century with, with Albert's vision, but also what was going on, I imagine, centuries before that in a, in a Renaissance workshop where there was interfusion and there was sharing mm -hmm. of not only what people said, but what they did. Yep. Mm -hmm. I'd agree. I'd agree with that, Roger. Yes, absolutely. Lots of sharing uh, in the Renaissance workshop and lots of disciplines as well. And when you bring lots of disciplines together like that, you get new ideas. Uh, and that's where new ideas come from rather than everybody being of the same discipline. So, yeah, I absolutely agree with that, Roger. And we've had um, well two year groups now who've missed out quite a lot on practical experiences in the lab uh, at the A-levels or GCSEs. Um, children who haven't been able to take part in the school visits that we would normally have, have done, where we, for example, in South Kensington, um, ran an event called Creative Quarter, where we would have um, about 3,000 um, workshop uh, participants taking part in finding out about careers in the arts and sciences. But do you think that there is a particular need now to develop those practical skills and that we can support this generation who are coming through schooling by this collaboration of arts and sciences? If that's going to meet, yes, absolutely. Yes. Now, now more than ever, I think. Um, I think. I think what's happened over the last year has thrown things into sharp focus. But I think for a number of years now, we've had really bad things happening in that the school curriculum is in secondary schools very often and before that is being eviscerated. All sorts of things are being taken out of the curriculum that people used to experience through being at school through music, through drama, through doing experiments in chemistry labs and physics labs, through uh, through doing things in DT or cooking, all those things, all those practical things, uh, and through drawing. Uh, and, and those opportunities are now no longer something we can take for granted. And yet they are crucial that people experience those things at that formative stage as they're growing up. Uh, and we need to make sure that we provide people with those opportunities, because otherwise it's a bit like not teaching people to read. You know, we all need these physical experiences. We need to understand how far we can go with something we're working on before it snaps. We need to understand how we describe what we're doing to other people, how to perform in front of other people without losing our nerve. All these things are crucial parts of being human and having the capacity later on to share ideas with other people when we're working, whether it's in science or art or anything else. And I think we are at a critical point now where if we don't do something about it, we're gonna find that a whole lot of skills are just not there in people who need them. Uh, I mean, of course, you know, it's, it's not all gloomy. There are a lot of very good things happening, but I think we all of us need to do everything we can to make sure that people have as rich an experience as, as, as they possibly can at Imperial, I think, and, and, and the, the exhibition sort of road group. We've got a fantastic opportunity here, especially with the new opportunities at White City to engage with people and to share that vision and give them opportunities to come and not only hear about stuff and see stuff, but do stuff.
Mm. I'm delighted to see in the comment uh, in the chat a, a, a comment from uh, Joanne Taylor that perhaps we should have a festival or exhibition curated as a collaboration between Imperial College and Royal Albert Hall that focuses on the intersection of arts and sciences. Well, I'm delighted to bring you the news that there is the Great Exhibition Road Festival, which really um, has been growing since 2019. We did the first big event, um, and in that event we um, did a sort of a potluck of um, pairing up the different institutions to collaborate and find where they had their synergies and to create new programming um, and that has grown and grown um, the, this year's festival will be later this year um, um, but it leads to all sorts of other sparking and programming collaboration so um, it is very much alive in uh, in the public programming of all of our partners at the moment. Um, Leslie I, I, I wanted to come back to you actually because you you teach art history at Imperial College, which I find fascinating. Could you, could you tell us a little bit about who you're teaching and how that, how, how that feels? Well, yeah, I'm, I'm glad you find it fascinating, Emily, because I also find it fascinating as well. Uh, and I was quite, uh, um, uh, quite um, surprised when the job was uh, um, an, uh, originally announced uh, because I, I just di did, didn't compute to me. So of course at the interview, uh, that's precisely why I asked at the interview, I said, um, uh, have you got this right? I mean, what are you doing um, art history at Imperial? Why? And of course at the interview they told me that what they wanted to do was foster an interdisciplinary um, attitude amongst students by introducing um, uh, such disciplines as art history. So yes, uh, it has been an extraordinary fascinating ride and it still continues to be so at Imperial because uh, Imperial students ask the sort of questions uh, that um, traditional art student, uh, art history students don't ask. Uh, they ask things such as uh, if Leonardo had, was, had a kind of paralysis of his right hand, what on earth did that, that to do with him actually not being able to paint? And this, this was an actual reference towards a letter that was written uh, by somebody called Antonio de Beatis uh, when he met Leonardo on the 10th of October 1517. He said that he had a kind of paralysis of the right hand and could no longer paint to his former degree of finesse. Uh, the student of course in the class said well if he was left-handed surely that shouldn't be a problem which of course was immediately countered by another student that said that if he had a stroke emanating from his the right uh, the left side of his body that would have affected his right hand that stroke could have also caused uh, um, some form of dyspraxia or in other words loss of coordination and therefore that would be appropriate then uh, that he wouldn't be able to paint to his former degree of finesse. So uh, this was quite extraordinary news to me. I could never quite work out why it was a paralysis of the right hand would have any effect on Leonardo whatsoever but here we have an imperial student that seems to have solved the problem uh, by in fact thinking outside of the box of art history and thinking of the practical terms of how a stroke might affect somebody such as Leonardo. So yeah these are part of the exciting um, times that we have at Imperial. Uh, another interesting painting is a painting of uh, um, uh, this is called um, Allegory of um, Venus and Mars where there's a blue curtain being pulled back in the background and the National Gallery haven't quite worked out whether the arm that is attached to the curtain is pulling the curtain over the scene or in fact revealing the scene and of course uh, an Imperial student then said well by the looks of the muscle groupings in the arm it looks as though the arm is actually in a, a situation where it's pulling back the curtain rather than pulling over the curtain. So again, uh, another revelation from Imperial students. So yeah, it's been quite exciting, really. <laughs> I love those kind of uh, those stories of thinking outside the box. It's just as Roger said earlier, the, the bringing, looking at one world through the lens of another, which makes um, things so such an interesting place to work in South Kensington. I, Angela, I wonder what the founders of the Great Exhibition would have thought about an art history course at Imperial. They might have assumed that everyone would be trotting down a, the road to the School of Arts and not needing. <laughs> I think they would have been absolutely delighted actually. I think that was Albert's whole vision uh, was to pull all these disciplines together and I think if you look at Great Exhibition Road now that is exactly you know 150, 170 years later what what has happened so yeah, i think you'd be absolutely delighted if we looked at south kensington now <laughs> We've um, we've done some lovely projects with um, with students who are studying art as part of their mechanical engineering courses at Imperial as well, and the, and that collaboration and thinking about the visitor experience in South Kensington through that lens is really just is is, is really fascinating. See, we've yeah, just all got of, eight. 
all roads, sorry, yeah. Emily, all roads leading back to Leonardo there, of course, because, of course, recently at the Science Museum, there was an exhibition of Leonardo's mechanical engineering projects. Uh, so, yeah, all roads lead back to Leonardo, so as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> sorry about that, Emily. <laughs> no, it's it, it, it's tying up beautifully. Um, we've just got a few minutes left. I'm just checking whether there's any questions coming in or if there's any questions you want to ask each other, actually. Um, but perhaps we um, just might think what um, are the sort of the takeaways from each of your different periods that we should be really bringing into um, into going forward in the 21st century? Um, Leslie, is there, is there anything that you can share with us? Well, I think the takeaways really from uh, my period is the um, is the idea that um, just because you are a designer doesn't mean you can't be an artist and just because you're an artist doesn't mean you cannot be an engineer or indeed an architect as well because they all uh, 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 it's about this idea of I suppose um, uh, using the skills you have and repurposing skills uh, and finding the uh, how these skills can actually um, it be interdependent on each other and I think also uh, to finally uh, take away on this is that when we were all at school we were all interdisciplinary because that's exactly what we were doing. We were going from one lesson to another. You'd go from maths, you'd go to art, you'd go to science, and then they'd all be under the same roof. And of course, as soon as we all go to university, they all separate. Uh, perhaps uh, we should have that sort of discipline uh, that sort of approach in universities where it's not all about just a single discipline but about trying to master quite a, a variety of disciplines like we did at school. That's a really actually goes to my own heart because as a mixed up teen my A-levels are physics, chemistry, um, art and history so I just did the subjects I loved and I didn't know what I was going to do with them and in fact you know getting to university channeled into arts or science but um, finding myself in London's arts and science district with a with a proud history and an exciting future perfect <laughs> landing spot um Angela have you any any closing thoughts from you on the um the, what the lessons of the great exhibition are for us today well I think surprisingly to me but I think the, the lessons are very similar to the ones that Leslie was saying that before the great exhibition when science and arts were kept very separate from British manufacturing then there was obviously this, this difficulty. Manufacturing and industry weren't doing particularly well. And the, the thing that the Victorians did, and particularly Albert, was to try and pull those together. And things really improved. Um, there was obviously a huge benefit to industry to have arts working with science. And Roger, um, what, are, what are your big takeaways from today? Well, I think my big takeaway really is this question of, of, of what you... What you see depends on what you look for and this idea of looking through different lenses it seems to me that this that, this, that one way of countering this i think very unhelpful narrowing of, of 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 defining yourself as an artist or a scientist just doesn't really doesn't make sense and and i mean after all the the language is is uh, it's a language of connection we talk about performing operations we talk about performing experiments there there is performance and, and instruments and all these things in, in, in all of these areas. And so I think if, if, um, if we can develop that, that idea that, well, first of all, that we all of us do many different things, even if we're scientists, we very often have um, all kinds of other interests, but we tend to keep them in watertight compartments and not see them as connected, but one as being a, a, a sort of break from the other. Uh, but I think if we, there's a lot of sort of internal integration to do. But I think that there's also sort of external integration in, in terms of looking around us to see what are the other people who are doing things that that could resonate or could be of interest and of help to what we are doing and there may be people all around us anyway but we just no, don't notice them or there may be people on the other side of exhibition road or people we could go and 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 arrange to have a cup of coffee with and and not all of these things lead to anything but i think creating the conditions where serendipitous encounter is more likely is something that we can all do, but it requires a little bit of effort, not very much, but a little bit of effort and a little bit of refocusing. But if we can all do that, we're all of us in the in the midst of a really rich environment. And the trick, I think, is to make these connections um, that that are, are, are kind of there in as as potential all the time. But we just need to do something to crystallise them. We've had one question in from Sarah who says, where in London can we experience um, inventions and innovations exhibited in the 19th century and which have our direct resonance today for our, for our lives today? But also, where can we experience that uh, serendipitous 
exchange that you were just talking about, Roger, and I'm pleased to say that place is South Kensington. I look forward to seeing you there soon. I look uh, forward to being back in the real world and everyone having those opportunities to meet and, and bump into each other. Um, unfortunately, that brings us to the end of this lunchtime discussion. I feel like we could have talked for <laughs> so much longer, but thank you so much, Leslie, Angela and Roger for joining us today. Thank you for all of you watching on YouTube. And I'm sorry if we didn't manage to get to your question or read out your thoughts, but thank you for sending those in. Um, a recording of this discussion will soon appear on the Great Exhibition Road Festival YouTube channel for you to watch again and again or to share with your friends or colleagues whenever you want to. Um, and all future live events and recorded video from the festival will be appearing on that new YouTube channel. So do follow us and you'll get a little notification when there's a new live event or a recorded video that's been posted. We would really appreciate your feedback. Um, we will have a link in the YouTube chat for an evaluation form. So please tell us what you think of this event. Um, otherwise, that's it from me. Thank you to everyone who tuned in. Thank you to our panelists. And I hope to see you in South Kensington soon. Have a good afternoon.